Welcome to the Pick Up The Flow show. I'm Selwa and today my guest is Eve Essex, musician and composer based in New York. Hi Eve, how are you? <laughs> Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you for being here. Um, the tradi tradition of this podcast is to let the guests introduce themselves. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm a musician. I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I play mostly woodwinds and sing and uh, compose and play in a variety of bands. Um, yeah, and I've been doing that for about 10 years now. Oh, wow. Nice. So, like, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, central Ohio, like outside Columbus, but pretty boring suburban. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, like, were you, like, what, uh, like, what drove you to New York? Uh, yeah, I guess um, I moved here after college. A lot of my friends moved here. I didn't come immediately. I spent some time doing artist residencies. I was in Boston for a little bit, but uh, yeah, I guess I found Boston was not very hospitable to making art if you're not part of an institution. And so I just followed my friends here. And so like you, you studied uh, art, right? Or Yeah, um, I started college as a music major, actually. Like I was very into classical music growing up. So I initially I went to music school and studied orchestral bassoon, uh, but it was not a good <laughs> match for me. And also classical music kind of like destroyed my body um, from playing hours a day. Um, so I ended up uh, dropping out and I went to RISD after that and studied sculpture. Um, yeah, and so I guess I spent a few years trying to figure out my way as a visual artist, but it, it kind of always had a time-based element. Like I was making videos or performances, kind of installation type stuff that would be activated by performers and it's slowly found its way back into music <laughs> over a period of several years. Nice. And was it like uh, at RISD, like, did you have a sort of community or how was uh, your, your life like the, at RISD? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say there was a real community there and like I still Um, I'm friends with a lot of people that I met there um, and have collaborated with some of them. And um, yeah, it was an interesting place. Like I was able to keep playing music. Like I was involved in classical music at Brown the whole time I was there. And also there was a really big music scene in Providence, like big noise music scene and people making electronic music. Um, so there was... Yeah, it was vibrant, creative community around the school. Um, that yeah, it was a good experience. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, yeah, we had also Hisham as a guest, and he shared a similar uh, point of view with like Risti and Provid, like like being in visual art but having music as well. Like, do you feel like your music practice was? Uh, like necessary at that time or when I was in Providence I would say it was interesting like I still was playing classical music so like I played in a woodwind quintet or like Whoa. I would do chamber music kinds of things um through the through the school um and I wasn't performing so much but there were friends of mine that were like um Like Alex Field, DJ Richard would do parties or like Goucher Lustwork like oh, also nice. did. I mean, he, they did parties together. Um, James Kay was there. Like there, there were a lot of people that were involved in the music scene there. Um, it was also kind of the height of power electronics. So it was like you could go to oh. shows and people would throw full glass bottles of Whoa. beer around <laughs> and stuff. So it was like a super masculine scene also that I didn't really... 
I didn't have yeah. a lot of desire to like jump into the power electronics world, um, although I was an interested observer for sure. Yeah, and so uh, when did you move to New York afterwards? I moved to New York in 2009. So yeah, I've been here like 15 years now. Oh, wow. Like, do you feel like, um, like, how do you, how do you, f like, if you have to reflect on all of those years, like, what's, what's the, like, do you want to stay in New York in the future? How do you mm. see the city? Yeah, I mean, I love it here. Um, I guess, like, I don't know, like I said, I grew up in Ohio, I felt like a total freak there, and that I didn't know how to mm. find my people there, and... Yeah, I feel like in the city, it's just like full of people from all walks of life and lots of like highly motivated people, creative people. And I just immediately felt like, uh, I wouldn't say I felt immediately at home, but I felt immediately interested in what was around me. And also, I think I really like the option, like having the option. Yeah. It's like if I felt the need to get out of my house on any night I could do yeah. that like there's just sort of possibility all the time it's so true and and also like the scene like the experimental scene and improvisation scene in New York is so strong and like yeah yeah there are shows every every week so uh, at that time were you going to shows like did you know people in New York when I moved here yeah I mean, not so many, like a few people who had moved um, from different walks of my life and a lot of people who were in school in Providence ended up here, I think, just because it's close. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's like I I moved in with like my best friend from high school when I was wow. here, so it's like I had... a. I had friends, but I wouldn't say I knew a ton of people here. It took me a long time to really wrap my head around, yeah. say, like the experimental music scene. I think it, it didn't take that long for me to find that, but um, I wasn't really aware of it when I arrived. Well, so was it, um, um, were you uh, working full time as a musician when you first arrived here or? No, I, I mean, I guess it's like I, was working on art stuff, um, and I would not even call that like working <laughs> necessarily. I was like trying to figure out how to make work, and I was working for artists. So like, initially I started working as an artist assistant. Um, I worked for a number of visual artists, but then through that got wrapped up working for a few experimental musicians as well. So. Uh, yeah, some of my first jobs were making websites for artists, oh. writing grant applications, trying to help them um, uh, get projects together, some like production support types of things. Wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it took me, I don't know, probably three or four years till I started actually like showing art and like um, doing my work in public. And was it like a, when you say showing your art, like your um, like artworks and music pieces as well, or? Uh, I think so. I was mostly doing visual art and performance. Um, oh. Yeah, I, and through I had a um, a collaboration, which I'm trying to even remember when it started. Maybe like 2000. 11 I started working with Juan Antonio Olivares um, who's a visual artist and we did um, a project called Essex Olivares that had oh, yeah. um, we I mean we did a lot of like kind of elaborate ensemble performances so things for like uh, like pieces of many skills mostly they were like five to 20 people doing these elaborate kind of scored performances. Wow. And we created kind of sculptural sets that became um, props and also sometimes musical instruments for the people involved in it. Um, but instruments is kind of like a wide, <laughs> wide ranging <laughs> term. Like there was a piece where we had like a bunch of uh, huge fans that had uh, been hooked up to 
max msp so that Whoa. like fans were like putting sound all over the room while people were doing movement and making sound oh. um they're very uh hard to explain i guess <laughs> um but uh that was sort of what I was working on when I f was initially getting going in New York is making these kinds of performances and videos. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I remember, um, like, reading your your uh, <laughs> your LinkedIn. I feel ashamed to say that. <laughs> because it's like, it's such a, like, we, it's like a reality, like, in New York, because we need to survive. Yeah. Like, so we need those jobs. And, yeah, anyway, but... Um, yeah, I read that you worked at Issue Project Room uh, as a marketing director. So, um, yeah, I'm really curious about your time at Issue because I think at that time a lot of um, there was a lot of really inspiring performances. Like, do you have like one perform performance in mind that um, left a lasting impression on you? I mean, there are so many. Yeah. Uh, I was there for about five years and um it was i mean it, it, i feel like i was involved in like hundreds hundreds of shows probably over wow. that time <laughs> uh there were yeah i mean when we were in the livingston street space at least there were times when we were doing like three or four shows a week so um and i went to all of them because um I mean, I was involved in all of them, but also like marketing director is a mm -hmm. in a in a space where there's only like five people running so many shows. You wear a million hats, yeah. so like I was also the videographer and like managed all the documentation of all the shows. Wow. So I actually was attending all of them and like watching them extremely closely wow. through a camera, um, which is an interesting way to see the work uh, for sure. I think it sparks you to pay attention to different stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many. I I guess one thing that really stands out is, like, a collaboration between KG Haino and Tony Conrad, uh, mm. which um, I just remember Tony was playing a plastic milk jug with his Whoa. mouth and his hands. <laughs> um, but it's, it was nice. amazing somehow. Like, it just worked perfectly. Um I loved uh, Colin Self and Raul de Nieves did like a big opera called The Fool that was just amazing in terms of like the scale of it. I mean, the music was mm -hmm. beautiful, but theatrically it was really exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so hard to count. I think the residency program was definitely the most fun part of it and mm -hmm. like worked really closely with folks to figure out how to produce their work and see them in the space rehearsing when you're at work. Um, so, yeah, I feel like working with all the people who were part of the residency was probably the most enjoyable part of that job. Well, so was it uh, at that time, like, because you're there every day, like you see all of like all this work, um, were you... What was the effect on your creativity, on your own work? Yeah, so I guess it's probably the reason that I got back into playing music. Um, the, I, like, I bought a saxophone, I think, in 2011 or maybe even before that. I had acquired one and I had touched it a little bit but not really gotten into it. Um, and then... I think after watching so many shows and honestly, like not all good shows, like <laughs> shows that were terrible, shows that were good, shows that were mind blowing. But like, I think ultimately over the whole spectrum of things, I started realizing like, oh, like this seems actually something that's totally accessible. Like, I feel like I could do this. And um, in terms of performing as an artist like on stage rather than in the concept of like more kind of environmental installation kinds mm. of things um it just started making me think about focusing more into a concept of like a musical performance um so definitely it inspired me to get back into playing music um 
And also, I was allowed to use the space as a practice space. (laughs) So (laughs) that also made a big difference. Um, I wasn't very good at playing the saxophone at the point that I started doing that. But um, it's a huge room with like 40 foot arch ceilings, which if you play a woodwind instrument in that huge marble room, you sound like, you, I just felt like a superhero. Because <laughs> there's so much natural reverb that it glosses over every imperfection. Oh, so wow. I actually got very into improvising in there. Um, I did a lot of recordings with my friend Dan Fox in there. He would come in and play piano and clarinet and we could just like go crazy in this big room and record it. Um, wow, that's so cool. And yeah, speaking of improvisation, like um, like what um, drove you to this like uh, way of like making music? Into improv? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I think that that was where I started mostly because I didn't know how to play the instrument very technically. Although that's maybe, um, let me put that differently. So uh, I mentioned that like I was very into classical music growing up and playing classical music is all about um, technique and like getting everything just so perfectly aligned um like practice it so much that it like goes past yeah. overwork to feeling natural again um i uh had become so accustomed to playing with an end goal of creating something so polished that when i started playing again i wanted to break all this habits so like i got a saxophone because I didn't know how to play it and I've maybe just like kind of inspired by like um DNA or something like bands mm. where it's like they would play instruments that they didn't know how to play and just try and figure out to say what they needed to mm-hmm. on them so um yeah I also around I think it was in 2014 like that was when DOS Audit formed and at that point, the other people in the band knew how to play their instruments, but they invited me to play in it also. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it took me several practices before I realized that my saxophone had a bunch of leaks and like that oh. was why it was sounding so crazy is that I just like, needed leaks? repair. Like, like um, on the, but- the buttons on a saxophone, if they don't close all the way, the oh. air leaks out and that means that it'll squeak or like you can't control the instrument. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, I was just trying to make expressive sounds. <laughs> and yeah. there's enough similarities between wind, in- wind instruments that eventually like I found my way around it and started pr- playing scales again and actually practicing seriously. But... It took several years of improvising for me to kind of like break down um, all my hangups around classical music. Oh wow! So like, um, um, sorry to go back quickly into your car- career trajectory. Um, in in 2016, you um, I, you so you 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 enrolled in a boot camp and you learned uh, software engineering. Yeah. I did, um, and, although yeah. I was doing engineering before, before. Yeah. yeah, um, I taught myself to do like HTML as a kid. Oh, wow. I was really into making websites like <laughs> as oh, a child, yeah. um, but that kind of helped me find all the jobs that I found. I think it was like of all the people who were trying to be like an artist assistant or whatever, like knowing how to be a website gave me a leg up to find jobs, but I did that for a lot of places. Like Issue still uses the website I built. Oh, really? That's <laughs> yeah. your wow. Like that's so old. Oh my God, wow. Um, I, was, I was wondering, like, I didn't know. Wow, that's so impressive. Uh, there's like some residencies in town that still use the ones I built. I worked out wow. for Artist Space doing their website for a while. So like, oh, wow. it was always kind of part of it, but I think so working at Issue was a struggle because I. it's really hard to play shows. I was starting to get to the point where I was going to play shows. And if I have to go to a show like four or five nights a week, mm-hmm. there's no time to rehearse. There's no time to 
book a gig like mm. you're always having to prioritize the gigs like I had to move gigs because something came up at work and their mm. dates were higher priority priority than my own um so it was just like also I made so little money that I was freelancing as a web designer the whole time that I worked there so well. it's like trying to balance so many things was not really feasible and I decided that I would switch to software full-time just so I could work less and make enough money to pay my rent and yeah at the time I think it was like the boot camp thing was pretty new it had only been around for a couple of years and I mm. knew some friends who did that and they told me that I should do that instead of being a freelancer wow. uh, which is I'm so glad <laughs> somebody told me that yeah. because like I'm not a good freelancer. I'm not good at begging people for money at like keeping track of a million clients. I yeah. found it really challenging. And also I mostly work for artists, which aren't really high paying gigs to begin with. Yeah. So like um, I ended up doing that and learned um, I, just like a lot of the skills that are more like how people do things in a corporate environment mm -hmm. versus how you would do it on your own um but also like yeah I learned much much more about programming than yeah. I did before um yeah so I did that and then I switched to doing software engineering and got out of working in the arts uh explicitly that's yeah honestly that's so inspiring because I know so many people and Myself, like I did the UI bootcamp, mm -hmm. like so many people did bootcamps and to be able to uh, have a, a successful outcome out of it is, uh, is a challenge. But also like the fact that you did it and at the same time you have your career is so important because I think when you, I don't know, like if you just do a full time music career, it's very challenging and it can make you like hate, you know, like music. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, yeah, that's that's such a smart move, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in terms of music, I feel like I started kind of late. Like I was doing other things for so many years before I came around to like starting to establish myself as a solo artist. The idea of mm -hmm. actually making a living of it felt pretty far away at the time that I was thinking of changing my career. Um, And yeah, I don't know. I feel like I know a lot of people have done boot camps and had mixed experiences. The one I did was like, they guaranteed they'd refund you if you didn't find a job, Whoa. which is why I did it. Because it really? was like, at the time I was broke, I spent Whoa. all the money I had to do it. But it was like, I can do this for a few months. I'll get my money back if it doesn't work out. Damn, that's it. That's it, so cool. It did work out, yeah. which I feel lucky. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, I knew... I wanted to stay in New York. I need money. I yeah. can't like you can't like pay your rent on playing at like Trans Pecos for thirty yeah. dollars. Like it wasn't gonna happen yeah. for me as a sax band player at that time. Then, yeah. Oh my god. That's like I, I could like create a channel on just like complaining <laughs> on this. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'm really interested in your um, like. How do you find that your back background in music influences? Uh, your approach uh, for uh, to programming and software engineering? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, it's kind of hard to put my finger on. Like, um, I think since I've started getting into composing more and writing explicitly orchestrated scores for multiple instruments, the connections have started to feel a bit clearer to me in terms of like architecting like a problem that has like multiple components that are planned in advance and mm. um, handed off to performers and run it, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. So like, yeah, and in, in, my, in my current job, it's like I work in the music industry mm -hmm. but I would say that the the amount that I think about music at my job is surprisingly little which 
oh. is very different from what I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so now I'm working at Bandcamp. I've been there like over three years now, and I look at music all day, <laughs> but it becomes just like things in tiny boxes, <laughs> and I'm, my mind is more yeah. concerned with like what's the aspect ratio variations <laughs> between all these different pictures of LPs or like, I don't know, I work on yeah. kind of much lower level problems than would affect like, um, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I, I've learned weird things that I probably wouldn't have about licensing or oh, wow. royalties and stuff like that. Um, but overall... I feel like the things that overlap are more about um, formal concepts of like composition, like um, in terms of like making something like elegant and with like as little uh, excess information as possible. And it, like, do you also use like your um, visual art background? Like, do you feel like it's That, I think, probably yeah. has more of an impact in terms of software, in terms of, um, yeah, being able to, like, visually replicate things. Yeah. yeah. And even uh, your website, uh, which is, I think, below, I think it will oh, show okay. up. It's really interesting, like, how, yeah, it's very well, like, organized and, yeah, really, like, I really enjoyed your website because, like, most of the time... Artists have like kind of like all over the place websites and it's nice to be able to find like shows and have um, so I can see her also yeah music composer and programmer and visual art mm-hmm. mind combined into <laughs> yeah. that piece of artifact. My greatest achievement yeah. by <laughs> six year old person. <laughs> it it does the yeah, it does the job, but um but yeah, speaking of your music practice, I would love to play Maybe we can play two minutes of this um, uh, performance, uh, Honeypot. Three words, two symbols, one number. Don't repeat that.
so yeah, can you talk about this project? Uh, so it's Eve SX and the Fabulous Truth. Yeah, so the big band is something I'm trying to get rolling. Um, oh. We uh, so I started during the pandemic. I got into writing scores kind of for the first time. That was when I started doing that. Um, I think uh, we talked about improvising and how that was how I got into music. But I think at that point, when I was kind of cut off from the ability to perform publicly or to play with other people, I mm -hmm. started writing MIDI because I wasn't enjoying <laughs> playing my instrument. So mm -hmm. I got into orchestrating and was teaching myself to do it over a few years. And um, and at the time, it was a pretty nonspecific. Like, I wasn't having any kind of specific players in mind or specific ensembles. I was just thinking about if I was not the person playing this, like, what would I want the sounds to be? Mm -hmm. um, so initially, my practice was... Or uh, up until like the pandemic, my practice involved a lot of hardware. I would use synths and samplers and trigger everything in real time. Uh, a lot of looping pedals, live processing types of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and my whole process of constructing a song was constrained by the limitations of what I could do with like two hands yeah. in my mouth. Um, so they're extremely sparse often and mm. it moved at kind of a glacial pace because I was trying to transition many instruments simultaneously. Um, so moving to a zone of writing something in advance and using other instruments changed a lot of things in terms of... Um, I could use different tempos, I could cha use different sounds, I could use things that I physically wasn't able to execute myself um, mm. because of the limitations of my instruments or just my performance ability. And um, so it sort of evolved into a songwriting or composition practice. And I'm getting ready to put out the first album of that material in the summer. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's like, I'm calling it the, f the fabulous truth. It's the name of the next album, but it's also the name of the live version of that, um, ensemble or like when I perform with an ensemble, I guess that's the way I'm going to be billing it. Nice. Yeah. It's so inspiring because like you, like you, uh, like you wrote the, the lyrics you composed and perform live and sing and it's like it's so i think it goes back to maybe like also what you were saying about like having to do multiple things and like we're just humans like being limited by our hands yeah. basically. <laughs> but it's so nice that like you didn't let it um prevent you from like uh executing the idea of the project um, I think it's opened up so many more options also. Nice. Like, um, I think initially I didn't really know what I was going for. And it's, yeah, and it's expanded for sure. And um, yeah, vocals have become a really big part of that. And I think um, it's... Uh, most, mostly because it's a lot easier to sing when you have like a group behind you than it is yeah. when you're trying to uh, play. And um, I, yeah, it's been, you're right that it is still like enormous amount of multitasking, but it's like, it gets divided out over like, it's mostly like preparation, preparation for the, the moment when you execute it. Um, and like are you yeah i'm really curious about your opinion on like technology like is this because i feel like um you know with with ai or like with with i don't know the new technologies that we have um it feels like um like a like like it's hard to it's hard to like we have a unlimited 
ways of making music and is it like a statement like you wanted to be more human like because you're using the voice and then having mm. other people bring their part to it is it intentional yeah. I mean I don't I don't think it's yeah. like a statement against technology necessarily I will say I mean I feel like it's kind of untrendy <laughs> um, there's a definitely yeah. like a kind of 70s psychedelic rock energy especially to that song um which like I think for me as a performer it's like uh instruments that you breathe through just like click for me so um like the first instrument that I played was piano and I took lessons on and off like throughout my life over many years and it just never clicked for me I've tried to play guitar bass like all these instruments that just didn't click and something that you breathe through um the way that you power a voice or the way that you power a woodwind instrument for me is like the best feeling in the world like I love wow. playing those instruments I love to just like play a scale to play <laughs> drums like um I definitely spend a lot of time just like doing the practice and um yeah the breathing is super therapeutic it's a really physical experience and so for me that's just the way that I like to play and it's the way that feels most natural to me as a performer mm -hmm. um and I like to play with people also and the interactivity and the kind of unpredictability of it um and so yeah I mean I use technology it's like I'm using I like I'm writing my scores on a computer and I use Ableton as like a tool throughout that to kind of sample different sounds into it. So that's, um, and actually there's a fully electronic version of like all of these songs that I've done. Um, so like uh, getting all these people into a room has happened extremely, extremely rarely um, because like it's impossible to schedule folks it's really expensive to hire people and like get studios and stuff to do that so um yeah I'll work in Ableton to make like electronically produced versions of all of the arrangements and then sort of like slowly bring in like multi-track versions of different instruments into it like as I'm writing um but yeah I think for me the I love synthesizers I'm really interested in them but like mm. my brain despite really knowing how to use a computer like when I'm thinking in real time of playing like it's not an obvious performance instrument for me like I don't mm. know how to play it intuitively which might be a time or practice but yeah I, I think you're right with like intuition it's it's so important to just uh, follow what what you think is right I, in yeah i i agree with you like i have a, a similar uh, yeah point of view but yeah to go back to like some of your other works you um in 2022 you uh, wrote a soundtrack a score for uh, today i'll be bread a film by andy cahill and um yeah i'd love to like play a short uh, Maybe we can talk over it. But um Yeah, so so you scored the whole film, right? Like yeah. Yeah, so our process for this um Andy brought me this animation and um just before we did this, he actually made a music video for me which should come out pretty soon i think maybe in april or may oh, um nice. but then he had been working on this longer project and brought it to me and um there was some there was some sort of like placeholder things and a little bit of like sound design but um yeah essentially i guess <laughs> i was just saying that it's hard for me to use electronics intuitively but this project actually was that like putting up the video in ableton oh, yeah. and just like sort of sketching along as i watched it um and it was so much fun um 
I think because animation also really begs for the sound to be extremely expressive of the image like this mm -hmm. of like like you need to illustrate the bouncings <laughs> and um so yeah this was a really fun process of using electronics layering in voice and woodwinds and um he and i also worked together to develop some of like the sound design elements and do all the mixing and production elements for the sound um, so it was a really, really, really fun collaboration and also kind of like the opposite of what I had thinking about, been thinking about when I started doing the composed scores because like the, I guess like the visual itself is more of the score in this element in that it like dictates the timing and um, the kind of mood of everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I loved having somebody else's ideas to bounce off of. And um, in the same way that it's like when you're doing improv with somebody, it's like 50% of it is listening and kind of like understanding what's going on in the rest of the sounds that are happening. Like I liked having that experience of like so much content coming from somebody else's vision, but that, um, yeah, but that it's not, but that they're not making sound. It, it was just a really different experience from what I had been accustomed to in the past. Um, yeah, so that was super fun. And then um, I just had another soundtrack come out of, just a few weeks ago oh, yeah. at the end of February for yeah. um, a film called Break Break. And that one was interesting and really different from this one because it was live action so um it doesn't have the kind of like fantastical humor and also um yeah you have to like treat sound differently i think when you're like in a when you're depicting like actual physical space and real people it cannot it cannot be so whimsical yeah so um yeah what do you find the most challenging about the process of composing uh, music for films and uh, also like what do you find the most rewarding about it? Um, I think the most rewarding aspect of it for me has been like um, kind of removing some of my own hang-ups that I have around process and writing so like I spend a lot of time planning it's I don't work quickly I'm not like a prolific person I work very very slowly and deliberately and usually plan things out very far in advance in terms of like having the text kind of figured out and like figuring out what the instrumentation is and so the process of doing the film soundtracks has been like really immediate and just sort of like throw stuff at the wall, see what sticks. And um, so it's kind of opened me up to a lot of different things and also made like the genre distinctions a lot blurrier, like can try different kinds of genres and different instruments um, that I wouldn't probably have otherwise. And mm. um not get too hung up on performance. I don't know, like I was playing like clarinet and things that I'm not very good at and like would never play on stage, but <laughs> yeah. like I can talk around in my, <laughs> in my studio with it and like get some some moments. Um, in terms of challenges, like I think um, I really want to do more projects like this for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think looking back now, I'm I'm like, almost thinking like le like less is more is probably gonna be a good maxim like going forward into these projects of like not like I don't think the sound needs to be like fully present all the time and sort of giving myself um keeping in the back of my mind that it's like to make like more intentional and smaller statements I guess would be my goals like for the next one Nice. And um, yeah, speaking of uh, bands, you're, uh, you're currently part of uh, Das Ujit and Love of Life Orchestra. Um, yeah, I'm curious to know, like, how do you balance your time between your solo practice and 
the commitment with multiple bands? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So Das Ada is um, has been going on for a long time now, like 10 years. And um, we've kind of reached a rhythm there that um, it comes in waves. So like mm -hmm. our, initially when that project started, the concept was like, we're going to play every single week. So we played every one time a week, every week for like, I don't know, maybe three years or something, Whoa. like for a really long time. Um, and that sort of fell apart, like people moved and like we kind of, our lineup yeah. became less um, less uh, strict. So um, in recent years, it's happened mostly through like very focused spurts. So uh, for example, last month we played at PS1 yeah. and we did like, um, in this Recruit to a Venetia exhibition, there was a, a rehearsal room. I think, I forget what it was, the piece itself is called. I think it's called Rehearsal Studio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it's just like a box with a practice space. So we were going there every week for like a month and playing oh, wow. in there. Um, just like every weekend we would play in this box <laughs> in the museum. Um, And so, like, that was a really focused moment where, I mean, we played a little bit in my studio before we went there, too. So it was, like, I don't know, six weeks of, like, all DOS on it. Yeah. And, then, um, and then, I don't know, we haven't, we haven't played again since then, but hopefully, like, later this year something will come about. But we did something similar a couple years ago at Kaj. We had a residency for, like... I think two months, but it was like just be in the space together and get really get things really tight and then do performances in like a concentrated period, um, which like I think the next level would probably be like we need to start documenting them better because yeah. like Das Ode has performed so many shows, but uh, we wow. have not released like anything since 2016. So um, it's uh, it's kind of like a fleeting thing. <laughs> um, and Love of Life is similar. Like the, those shows are not super frequent. There are a lot of rehearsals for when they happen. And um Yeah, I have to, like, manage the time. But I guess it's kind of become a thing where it's, like, I'm just focused. I try to just focus on one project at a time and, like, schedule them in a way that I can do that. Um, and this is, like, a, a thing that I've definitely thought about. I don't think I'm, like, very good at it, <laughs> like, in terms of, like, being able to schedule and do them all. But I definitely want to play and all the things because they're all so different from each other like Das Auto provides really different things to me as a musician than my solo music does um and like in and we even play like a lot of tunes that I write or like sometimes we play the scored things that I write but it's still really different because they are um I don't know nobody it's like a Everybody in that band that's like being a musician is somehow tertiary to other things in their life. That, maybe that's not accurate, but like, like Craig is mostly a visual artist and Dan is mostly a writer. Um, and I feel like they, they have a very different attitude from like, uh, say like the string players who are working with the fabulous truth it's like they play a score and they want you to have like oh. all the dynamics written in and like all the expressions and stuff. so it's like um working with so many groups has been yeah just like uh what am i trying to say yeah every performer yeah. has like a really different attitude yeah This yeah, that's really inspiring. That like you're you you have different uh, project that like brings you something different yeah. to your own practice, and um, and also at the same time, like you're not doing it full time because you have also other priorities. So it's uh, yeah. I wonder how how do you manage your time? Like yeah, how um, how do you manage your time and how do you envision yourself? Like in the future, with with yeah, like work and music. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't that's like a tricky question. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a weird question. There's a lot. I mean, yeah. I. Uh, it's hard. I mean, so like right yeah. now, I'm trying to get ready for. Uh, like, planning a tour and releasing stuff. I am doing some. Like, I have a recording session tomorrow, so it's in a moment where it's like, I got it practice every day Whoa. but only for like i just am doing like my technical like kind of maintenance um i feel like it's like when i i go through phases of writing and phases of performing so like mm -hmm. when you're in a kind of performance zone i feel like there's actually not a lot of space to write and it becomes all just like i go to the studio and i do scales and i do emails <laughs> and then like <laughs> when it goes into the writing phase then it's like then i can be more exploratory and um i don't know but still lots of like grant writing and stuff like that yeah. i don't know it's like i think i don't leave my house very much i guess that's how i, <laughs> that's how I manage it but it's like working from home is definitely helpful because like i don't have to go to an office i get some time back from that nice. um it's so true it would take you like two hours Yes. That, that was, no, well. Yeah, I used to go to an office in Tribeca every day, and it was like by the time I would get to my studio and eat something, it'd be like 8.30, play Whoa. for like 45 minutes <laughs> and go home. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just like f trying to not have pro different projects yeah. happening simultaneously has been um, my, that's my greatest time management, uh, like, tactic i guess right now mm -hmm. um and yeah i just like planning things <laughs> in advance um it's definitely like like for most of my career like until i worked at my current job i worked four days a week um and that was actually really essential and i mm -hmm. greatly regret giving that up because um it made such a difference in terms of like feeling like I could do my laundry and not be like, yeah. I should be somewhere else doing something <laughs> else right now. Um, but like, yeah, like this summer I'm going to do a residency, which I'm yes. hoping will give me like a way to step back and like, like I'm going to leave New York for two months and I'm hoping that will give me like for the first time in a very long time, like the ability to just like, not feel like all my time is very crowded <laughs> mm. yeah yeah it's so important to like sometimes like reset like yeah. your your time and not time it's i think it's like all in our mind oh yeah you know and um but yeah lastly uh do you have any upcoming shows or uh yeah i mean i guess i don't know if they might some of these might be happening after this comes out but um yeah. I'm playing on the 18th in Brooklyn at Grimm uh, Brewery. Uh, I'm playing on the 20th of March in Vermont at Epsilon Spires mm -hmm. in Brattleboro. And um, in May, the Love of Life Orchestra is going to be at Bowery Electric, May 3rd. And then, yeah, I think May, May and August, there's going to be a bunch of shows kind of around like Midwest, Tennessee and Eastern Seaboard. So like, there's definitely stuff coming. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Eve. This was awesome. And yeah, make sure to include all of your links. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for talking to me about <laughs> my work. I'm really glad to share. Appreciate it.